When I meet someone I know on the street and I start to tell him about my project, the average reaction that I encounter is this. <laughs> what? Associating food and music, an avenue age weirdo, go and find yourself a real job. And even if this might sound more than reasonably, more than sensitive, as well as quite groundbreaking as a topic, it turns out that at the end of the day, it's not that sensitive, not that groundbreaking at all. My average answer to this question is uh, what? The project I believe in forecasts the use of acoustics as an alternative to pesticides, currently used in agriculture, as well as music or sound as an alternative to hormones currently used in fish farming. As we said, even if this might sound sensitive and groundbreaking, it turns out that it's not sensitive, not that groundbreaking at all. And in fact, the association between food and music, it turns out that it's basically as old as food and music themselves. We have records of early Mesopotamian civilizations holding their banquets in chants and dances. Same thing for Greeks and Romans with their symposiums and bacchanalias, who were doing many other things than just eating and singing. Same thing for Milstres and Troubadours in Middle Ages with the lutes and harps. Same thing for Georg Philipp Telemann, who, in the 18th century, would write tafel music, namely table music, which is a set of different compositions meant to be performed around the table. This will become both its masterpiece, as well as, some say, one of the founding milestones of the forthcoming chamber music genre. In modern times, though, things got a bit more specific and we tried to pull down the boundaries on this do, on, of these two apparently distant words. And for example, the Sicilian musician Roy Paci is using the dish as if it was a sort of musical score, associating to every ingredient a specific note that will later be performed on the stage during its live performance. This takes the name of gastrophony. But the lighting banquet has not been the only role that musical instruments had within gastronomy throughout centuries. Do you have any other guess? Someone down there, no, no, no? I mean, it's not an easy question, but it's breeding, breeding. And think how clever it is to hang a bell on a cow's neck. You have an ahead of its time GPS tracking system, which allows you to find your animals when they're lost in the woods without any use of batteries, no circuits, nor sats, nor GPS itself. Or think about Sicilian herders who, since centuries, are writing specific compositions of each and every phase of the herding, from when the animals are getting into the fence, from when the animals are getting out of the fence, when they're going to drink, when they're going to be milked, and so on. But uh, in modern times, uh, things got a bit more specific and we started to address this topic from, uh, uh, let's say, a bit more scientific way. And while I was studying at the University of Gastronomic Sciences of Polenzo, which is just behind the corner here from Turin, less than one hour by car, I was writing my dissertation precisely on this topic, and uh, I stumbled across into this. Gilted sea brims, after undergoing repeated listening sessions of the famous Moser K5-5 to composition, Einen Kleine Nacht Musik, resulted at the end of the, treat of the listening session into a more homogeneous population, meaning all fish were having the same sizes, as well as they were having differentiated concentrations of some enzymes. Despite the shocking results, it makes complete sense. It makes sense that uh, the acoustic environment in which a fish might live that is uh, directly related with its physiological responses. And in fact, it turns out that the acoustic environment and that a fish inhabits directly affects the production of cortisol, and cortisol is a growth regulating hormone. Stepping into another kingdom, plants have always been considered of uh, being barely be living beings. That's why we diagnose people when, unfortunately, there is uh, pretty much else left to, to be done with a persistent vegetative 
state to indicate how lively we think they are. But in modern times, things uh, changed again a little bit, and uh, the scientific community started to question how this was actually true and how plants responsive might have been towards their environment. These brought uh, to the creation of a group of crazy scientists who are calling themselves new robotanists, new robotanists, who started to believe that plants were able to think. This group is led by many prominent figures, such as Stefano Mancuso, Monica Galliano, Heidi Apple, Rex Cockroft. Stefano Mancuso, by the way, held an amazing TED talk on plants intelligence a couple of years ago. All of you are invited to watch it. And uh, the last two, uh, Apple and Cockroft, did a marvelous, marvelous research taking an experimental group of lettuces and letting them listen to the sound of a caterpillar chewing their leaves. On, uh, they left uh, silent the control group, and then on both groups, they put actual caterpillars who started to chew. Later, they collected the result, and what they came out with was that not only the experimental group increased their tanning levels, tannins are a plant's defensive strategy, so basically, they enhance their bitterness in order to appeal less likely to be eaten, to appear less appealing. Sorry for the trick game of words. So not only the experimental group was increasing their tanning levels when they were facing a potentially threatening sound, but they were doing this only and if they were facing a potentially threatening sound Whereas tanning levels remained unchanged in case of birds tweeting, raindrops, wind streams, and so on. This necessarily requires a signal discernment system. Stepping into another kingdom and getting back into the same kingdom, that is uh, plants, uh, not only plants hear sounds, but also insects do. And uh, since the invention of agriculture, which took place uh, something like 12,000 years ago, mankind always had to deal with two main big issues. First one are drought, second ones are pests. With droughts, we did it quite well and quite soon with the invention of irrigation channels, and for example, Egyptians were already mastering this technique. And for the second one, we did it quite well as well, till when, after World War II, with the advent of the so-called Green Revolution, we started to use synthetically derived pesticides in order to have a more efficient way to deal with our damned pests. These brought, uh, in the early 90s, to the, to the invention, the discovery, of an even more powerful pesticide called neonicotinoids, who are chemically similar to nicotine, and they act as neural receptors blockers. So basically, the insect will go on the leaf, will get in contact with the substance, and will have a sort of neural breakdown, total collapse. <laughs> The thing is that uh, research has shown that they were pulling down bees communities as well. And some might say, well, uh, why should I care about bees? Uh, I don't eat honey. And uh, the answer is, well, uh, bees are the main worldwide pollinators. So if you don't have bees, you don't have pollinated flowers. And if you don't have pollinated flowers, you don't have the vast majority of fruits and veggies. And if you don't have the vast majority of fruits and veggies, you don't have food. And if you don't have food, you die. And some might say again, well, but I don't need fruits and veggies, I just want a burger. Well, if you just want a burger, you need a cow which is fed on grass and many other flowers which are pollinated by bees. So if you don't have bees, you won't have cows, and if you won't have cows, you won't have your goddamn burger. After that, we had uh, two main uh, big ways to deal with our damn pest. The first one is what I called uh, spray and destroy where you wander around the field and you spray your poisons all over around without any sort of discernment. And you do this even if you don't need in that moment to treat. You, they use a special technique called the preventive treatment that is uh, treating any, any way. It's like uh, taking an antibiotic before you are ill in order not to become ill. It's the same concept. So this is one technique that is used and, he, and another one is the so-called integrated pest management, which is a, an umbrella of different agricultural practices. 
Among these is included the so-called sexual confusion. Sexual confusion is not the average term used to describe the formerly quoted Roman Bacchanalias, as someone in the room might have thought, you pervert, but is, uh, let's say, an agricultural technique aimed to confuse insect pheromones receptors. So basically, a pheromonal cloud will be sprayed all over around, and insects won't, won't be able to locate and find because they will be covered in a pheromonal gasm, let's say. Broadly speaking, pheromones are chemicals. But another great tool which is used by many insect taxas to communicate one with each other is the same one which is allowing this conversation to take place right now, which is sound. If you go on Google Scholar and you type pest management chemicals, guess how many researchers you would find? I'll tell you, dozillions, dozillions. If you go on Google Scholar and you type pest management sound, guess how many researchers you would find? One-fifth, one-fifth. So, if only we were able to create a disturbance signal which would prevent insects from hearing before finding each other, it would have an eco-friendly and cost-effective tool to help our farmers in managing their pests. Cost-effective, why? Because you wouldn't even need to buy it every year, as you currently do with pesticides, which, by the way, gives us cancer. You wouldn't even kill them you would just politely ask to go and do their own stuff, flirting somewhere else away from where we grow our food. If only we were able to create a device that would transform negative acoustic stresses with which our farmed fish have to deal with each and every day of their lives, it would result in a way higher life quality for them, as well as a way healthier food for us. I'm asking the scientific community to start and dig a bit more into this topic because the application that these new ideas could have within the food system are too good to stay there undisclosed. We have now the possibility to change the food system in which we are seemingly stuck today, and if we can do it, we must do it. Thank you very much.